Hello, and welcome to another Distance DevOps Lunch to Learn. This week's session is about Edge DevOps. We had a great, lively conversation with a lot of participation, and it will likely be part of a series, so enjoy. If you want to be a speaker, please let us know. Uh, we would love to bring in topics of any sort. So I um, looking at the clock, and we, you know, we, have a, we definitely have a quorum. Um, not everybody here was involved in the Edge-related uh, topics discussion, but you know, my thought was going to be to have a discussion around what Edge DevOps would look like. Uh, so, and and I can I can tee this up, and you know, if people want to. I'm happy to have a more freeform conversation, but the advertising was uh, Edge related DevOps, so I was going to jump to that. And we can, and I don't think it takes a lot of expertise if you're like, ah, I'm not an Edge person, I'm not that worried about it. Um, the reality is very few people, when they talk about edge, want to talk about the operational components of it. They all want to talk about, you know, Kubernetes on top of edge or running, you know, it's just going to be cloud and all those things. And so the DevOps conversation and the infrastructure admin conversation from a I'm re operating remote infrastructure has been largely not discussed. And so I wanted to open up the forum to talk, about that um, as a thing. So think through, you know, what does it mean to have a, you know, a data center? And I'll, actually, if, if I'm, I'll take a minute and frame this up a little bit um, without trying to define edge for me, too much for people, because it, it's, it's not that useful of a conversation. But we can frame out what, what the operational pattern is from a very different than the cloud perspective. Um, Right, because in cloud, you sort of have somebody running all that stuff behind the scenes. You never worry about what it takes to get an API that provides you with control surfaces. In on edge, there's a couple of assumptions that I would make, um, and we I'm I'm very happy if you want to pick them out and challenge them. So if somebody's like, just make a note or talk in the chat, um, and we'll come back to it. One is in edge infrastructure, typically you own it. Um, meaning that you're responsible top to bottom for what that infrastructure is. Um, there's some interesting multi-tenant IaaS on the edge I ideas, and I'm happy to talk about that, but the assumption would be if you're in a store, you bought the gear that's running in the store, you're on a telephone pole, it's the telephone pole, you're a city, you're, you know, the, whoever is running the infrastructure that's shared for that, like there's tons of, in, you know, in, the, in your house, in a building, a hospital, whatever, wherever you imagine this infrastructure is going to be, the assumption that I would start with is somebody has to manage that infrastructure from the bottoms up. And then on top of that, then that becomes, all right, so now I have this infrastructure. I don't have a lot of supporting pieces around it. So if I show up with infrastructure in a stadium, actually, it might be a good example, then you know I don't have DNS and load balancers. I don't have all of the other People forget with it's not just get me a machine, it's actually get me all of these other pieces, right? And firewalls and, and componentry and things like that that I have to deal with. And so there's a whole bunch of DevOps. How do I manage that? Um, that's that is worth talking about. And then we start getting into do we virtualize the gear? Is it small enough that I just want you know containers on bare metal? Do I, you know, how do I how do I think about what that management is? Um, and then Along those lines, you also get into the what ha, you know how do I manage it so if if somebody meaning you know i don't want to have to send somebody on site to take care of that I mean I could sort of see if I'm in a stadium and I have a, a game i'm going to have i t techs maybe babysitting the servers, but most of the time we think about edge we're assuming it's a truck roll and there's no i t presence and so whatever cost savings you have for edge could be completely wiped out if you've got you know, um, to send a tech out there, or you've got to send machines back and forth to get fixed. Um, so there's a, there's a ton of these sort of operational issues that people don't think about much when it comes to cloud infrastructure. It's all been sort of absorbed, uh, but are very real in edge. That, that's, so that's, those are the things I was hoping we would have a discussion about for a little while. Does that sound reasonable? Sounds great. And I'm ready to jump in whenever. All right, Larry. So, <laughs> or, or Donnie, anyway. go ahead. Um, no, okay, so, so I'll, go ahead. I'll chip in first with a, I'll, I'll start 
at the beginning because I think I have a problem and not really a solution. Um, and many of you probably have better <laughs> ideas on, on solving this. Um, and, the, and the problem I'll paint for you is I'll, I'll call it edge for, for this definition, which is branch offices. Um, so we've got, you know, 100, actually hundreds of branch offices around the world, but many of them are running contact centers. And so you got local telephony happening. Um, you're trying to manage all the local kind of, um, not just the, the endpoint clients, but the servers as well. Um, and so, and, and also of course the network in between there and the core data centers or the cloud, um, and then something out back and forth to the broader world. And so, you know, we, we I think came up with reasonable solutions for parts of those where, you know, we started, um, you know, doing internet breakouts locally because initially every, all the traffic was literally going back to a central data center um, on a hardwire and then going out from there, which was great for our applications, not so good as we moved more and more into SaaS um, and people had a need for traffic to communicate directly to and from the internet instead of, you know, um, go off on a detour through a data center for no particular purpose. Um, so, so there's that part of it, which, and I think it's a good example because any, any, you know, bank or retailer, anybody else has that same kind of scenario going on. Um, and one of the biggest challenges we ran into in, in the global context was um, the heterogeneity of it to kind of tie back into your IPMI Redfish conversation, which is um, every single network pipe is different. Many network providers are different. Um, all of the, you know, and, and being able to manage that effectively and especially over long periods of time where you're probably also changing vendors um, of your hardware over time so that you can't use any consistency there. Um, that's kind of the challenge we ran into so that we, when we were rolling out a lot of infrastructure automation for um, kind of the core, um, we were very challenged in being able to extend that because of the sheer heterogeneity there. And that's a problem that, um, you know, I'd love to hear from, from other people. How did you approach that kind of thing? Or did, was that not even a thing for you? No, I'd like, unless somebody else wants to chime in, Keith, Keith is on here. Um, he, he'd be able to back me up on some of this stuff. So several, several, several years ago, we worked on basically IoT, right? So, I mean, basically edge. A multi-data center, um, I won't say where it was at, but a major uh, mobile provider potentially. Um, but multiple data centers, the whole thing, it was roll the racks in, build, stand up from nothing to applications running on containers, full-fledged testing, et cetera, et cetera. And what you're talking about, Donnie, is exactly some of those things that we, you know, the, the challenges are. IPMI Redfish, we actually use Moss. Rob and I actually talked about some of this. We did not use, um, you know, the, 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 the word of the day here on this call. <laughs> uh, but we did use, so, so IPMI was a thing. We were all Dell for the most part. Yeah. Um, but it was literally, those are the challenges where you roll those in. And a lot of that provisioning happens over, at least in our use cases, where, you know, we were starting to work towards using like open gear and things like that to actually use as entry points to be able to automate those things like network um, router switches, all those things. Cause we would stand up Oni switches, provision those out, stand up the DHCP services, things like that, build bare metal using IPMI, lay down KVM, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But figuring out those, those pieces, that are the critical path outwards are the key points, right? And, you know, one of the other things that we talked about a lot, um, again, I, if Keith can chime in, it, he can vouch for a lot of this stuff is, at least in our scenario, because it was so massive, we needed a way that we were trying to work towards to ensure that when we provision, do we inject, if we have issues internally, we don't want to propagate that to any edge other resources that we have within our other data centers, et cetera, if that makes sense. So if you have a bad route, so we were doing BGP all the way down to compute and things like that. If we did something stupid, we would not want that to propagate out. So I'm going to end with that and let everybody else chime in. Also, Larry, don't forget to mention the fact that we also want to protect from stuff coming out. Coming yeah, exactly. In the larger enterprise. So when you have those desperate offices that may have their own implementations and it might affect the edge computer layer, you do have that issue where you don't want them to come back and damage your area. We did have that instance actually yeah. happen where we yeah. thought we were, we had, um, we had protected, we protected going out, but we didn't protect something coming in. 
yep. um, that cause that problem. So you, you yeah. do want to make sure you solve that problem too as well. I'm, 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 I'm making some notes in the chats about the about these topics because these are crit no, there's it, it ends up being this huge ball of yarn um, yeah right yeah um, and keep and, the, the zero trust thing is like one of the ones that drives me nuts because people don't want to talk about a lot of these edge applications you're literally inside the edge and outside the edge are both untrusted environments so the security models for, oh, I have a data center and I, I have a trusted con data control plane or a you know management control plane um, might not be a true statement. Exactly. Does, does the trusted and untrusted paradigm shift our understanding of enterprise? So when I grew up, when I was way young, um, the, the concept was the enterprise was, let's say the forest, right? And you had multiple grows within that forest, maybe a big division, even the fact that you had, you know, maybe a division overseas, you had uh, throughout the states and so forth. Have we, in our rush to kind of build this fully integrated society or world in the enterprise layer, kind of destroyed a little bit of that trust and untrusted consideration of the enterprise and, 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 and kind of kind of caused some of the collisions that we've talked about could happen, especially in the edge compute. And our efforts to get scalability, to get economies of scale, all those things, they start to break down the normal barriers that you would set up, right? If you had an office, say, in Iowa, you would set up some level of protection against a New York office causing you to come down. But what we've seen in this kind of, I think, in the last decade, is this push towards a, a kind of a you know, seeing the enterprise as one holistic company and allowing to leverage the compute power, especially on the edge across the enterprise, that way they get lower cost, right, for the for the power. Mm -hmm. Have we seen the encroachment of this issue of lack of separation causing catastrophic damage to the enterprise? Question. Yeah, yeah, I think I think we we always try to strike the balance between economics and efficiency, and we sometimes call it price to performance, and and we sometimes we can call it in this case price to security also, right? So we have sacrificed some of that with by genericizing the solutions to nth degree, I will call it, but uh, at the same time. Uh, just like in, in investing, never fight the market, you know? So like when you try to fight the market, it will crush you as a vendor. So you, you go with the flow and and if you are, ideally, you know, we we should fix the problems the right way, but like most of the time we end up fixing it just the way market wants it, which is economics rules most of the decisions. And the people want cheaper solutions faster and then they want people to work on those solutions who know that technology and you cannot educate the market fast enough as a vendor, as a small vendor, as a big vendor can, you know? So I think there are so many factors which play a role in that. And then I mean, we see some of the technologies like they spread like wildfire and some other ones which are better. We know they are better technologies. They don't, they don't. And it's interesting to study those patterns, I guess. Those are good points. Yeah, and, and you know, talking to the point of what we were talking about a bit ago, and that was all pipeline driven. So, I mean, we use GitLab, CI, everything pipeline driven all the way down. So it was hands off. And Keith can vouch for this. If we had an issue, um, we started over um, until we were successful and had good deployments. And that was several times a week. I see Keith, Keith shaking his head. He remembers those days. <laughs> that was a long time ago, man. That was like almost four years ago. <laughs> Where were we at? Nightmare. It was a nightmare that still scares me. The middle yeah, that was 2015, 2017. So. Let me ask you as a question, like what do you think makes a technology get adopted at a faster pace? What is that? Is that price? Oh, is that, what are the main it depends, three it, factors? It depends on this. It, it, just to be a smart, a smart ass, it depends on the CEO and what they read on the plane on the way in. 
<laughs> I mean, I, I sometimes feel that way. <laughs> I do. Yeah, I, I said this a couple weeks ago. <laughs> I, I feel like, because um, I'm still trying, to this day, someone needs to educate me. And I know Keith's kind of put up a flag saying that he's kind of done a reversal. But someone please educate me how Kubernetes overtook Docker Swarm. Please. Oh, that's easy. Oh, that's that's actually, that, that's that, I can, that I can answer because I was, I was in ground zero on that one. Yeah. Docker pissed everybody off by being um, basically, we are the, we sanctimonious. We are containers. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. They, they're, they, it, literally, they, they, it was theirs to lose and their decision to tell everybody they were right and every, they were smarter than everybody else and leave it to them um, cost them the market. Yep. Keith, you wouldn't know him. Keith, you wouldn't remember of any of those conversations, would you, years ago? No, but it tells me that there's two things, right? There is the there is an upstart that has the right answer at the right time, mm -hmm. and the arrogance of the leader in the space mm -hmm. to to submit or to to give up their space of dominance just because of the arrogance. We so had that. Question. Yeah, we had that at Axe Space. We we stumbled. Yeah. We were number two cloud after Amazon, and we had our like we bet all our bets on OpenStack and ignored the other factors like VMware was making us more money and stuff like that. My company, just, yeah. my company signed on to, to the Rackspace OpenStack system. We were like back when it was beta. And that's probably where, where I've heard it. That's probably where I met you, Rob, by the way, I think. I think you're right. And oh my God. Um, yeah, we went back to Amazon after yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But don't get me started on that either. I mean, the Docker I thing, mean, I think, has a lot to do with, um, you know, I think you got the, the initial dominant player, and they were, they hadn't figured out how to commercialize it, but they were also trying to shut out all of the competitors from being able to commercialize anything around it, because they were scared of losing their own opportunity to get big. And so they both had the inability to build the right product people wanted, and also the inability to let anybody else build it either. Um, and that kind of ended up with people running in a different direction. I think, right. the, I think the, early on they were trying real hard to make everything on top of Docker be a proprietary product. Yeah. Um, and that just wasn't flying. Yeah. Classic open core model. Well, not to mention how many times Keith remembers these conversations, we've all been ex exposed to these, is how many times did they try to reinvent the wheel and make something overly complicated that was a thing that was already in existence for mm -hmm. years? Like, let's talk about Linux networking, bridging, yeah. things like that. Come on. Yeah. I spent an hour, I spent yeah. an hour in, the, in the Docker office in San Francisco and was like, why are we here? I flew from Atlanta. Keith, you remember that? I flew from Atlanta to there just for that meeting. And I was like, this is ridiculous. And either I'm just really <laughs> stupid or this is a ridiculous meeting. Uh, you're saying gonna, they made, wait, I'm, they I'm made gonna, Linux bridging and firewalls for, more complicated? Yeah, exactly. exactly. I'm pause for a promo because <laughs> next week's topic is uh, IP tables and migrating exactly. off of it. So yeah. we'll come back tomorrow to trash on that. Exactly. Or next exactly. Week. exactly. And at the same time, Kubernetes refused. <laughs> at the beginning, Kubernetes didn't even have the ingress, right? And exactly. they decided this is outside of our scope. We're not going to implement this because... It's not. It's not in the. It's not in scope. While Docker was going and adding, it, was throwing in the kitchen sink for everything. Yeah. Yeah. I, this is. I mean, the the funny thing about Swarm, um, and actually, this is Edge Kubernetes is actually a you know a very relevant topic for this because Kubernetes is super complex for an edge and fragile. Um, and one of the things that um, Docker Swarm has done, and and uh, HashiCorp Nomad actually is very similar. Yes is it's super simple, right? They, they, I mean, there was a time Kubernetes community was very scared about the Swarm out of the box experience. Um, because Swarm, where I remember this was the Swarm in Seattle, the, the Docker con in Seattle, where they announced Swarm and they were like, oh my God, they made this so easy. Anybody can deploy a, a container, a, you know, container managed solution. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm still, it still makes me scratch my head that that, that wasn't, and people still use Swarm, yeah. but um, if, yeah. if we're going to do edge operational stuff, it's going to have to be that simple, right? You're going to have to take nodes, put them together and, and get, uh, you know, a clustered environment out of it. Yeah, that's a good point, Rob. I mean, you know, you made a comment a second ago that makes a lot of sense is, is Nomad maybe the right thing. You're very bad. 
it's it's even simpler than Swarm. Yeah. Well, if if you look at the Hashi stack, um, mm -hmm. and I, I have my own my own, we could have a whole topic about Hashi and praise them and and pan them simultaneously on as as a lunch. Um, be fun to invite one uh, uh, evangelist for them uh, into yeah. it. Um, but <laughs> but maybe we can get sworn up. Um, but the you know between like uh, console which provides DNS inf infrastructure um, you know and Nomad you actually have some reasonable components right and then you start throwing in something you know Terraform which isn't my favorite infrastructure is code models it's not a actually it's my favorite uh, there's none of them that are very good um, <laughs> so um, it's my favorite until something comes along and, and solves the problems I have with it. Yep. Um, you know, those are, those are core things that we have to be able to do. So um, if, if it's all right, I'm going to pull back a little bit and, and, and put the edge into perspective because we talked about CI, CD, which I think is essential from an edge perspective. If I'm going to build edge sites, I've got to have a CI, CD story mm -hmm. and infrastructure is code, which says if I'm going to do an edge site, it better not be uh, manual bespoke maybe, right? Where heterogeneity is real, but not manual. Um, how do how do we see right? Can can DevOps DevOps hasn't been very good about doing CI CD. That is I'm the, interested. I'm interested wait, in that. Say that again. I I I'm interested in DevOps CI CD. What what yes. like for for Recam, we were describing this as continuously integrated data center with this concept, but it's sort of like people are like, wow, that's really cool. And then implementing that has seemed like a bridge too far. But I, I don't see how you can do distributed edge sites without some type of, you know, continuously integrated, continuously delivered capability. Exactly. You shouldn't be doing anything without that to begin with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how do we get them to DevOps then? <laughs> I usually right, say the yes. DevOps is more about about Dev and not Ops. I mean, I think that's I think I don't know if you agree with that because mostly DevOps is focused on Dev and just delivery. And after that, Ops is like, okay, you go run it somehow. You know, it will. And that CI is part of that continuous integration, but this we don't have anything like CO continuous operations. Um, that's missing, and. Without that, it's the like operations is still left alone. Oh, I like the CO. What would a CO system look like? Like, you know, you, you're managing your logs and mining those for efficiency, efficiencies and security flaws and all kind of stuff, like anything operational day to day, uh, which is not part of DevOps right now. Would, would it look like I was continuously reprovisioning servers? Like, not, and server, I mean, in a generic sense. Would it look like GitOps? The, all right. So when I define GitOps, mm -hmm. it looks very, <laughs> very lightweight. But you're, are you describing something as more heavy? Maybe, yeah. Yeah. Like I'm describing like an event occurs, a pull, okay. a push, some kind of trigger, a webhook, something, and then something else gets triggered, right? Like, mm, okay. That's really what I'm like after as somebody in DevOps, right? Like if I do something something happens as a result of that exactly and i think that idea kind of needs to scale right like somehow yep. because normally that 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 translates into oh this is okay so when you add the word ops in this case it's beyond the it's beyond you know i check in code i get a new build what we're right. describing is right checking code I, it's going through and it's going to get the, rolled up into into images and deployed, right? That's yeah, it's actually going to go out somewhere. Exactly. It's reactive. I mean, it's it's all about being reactive to certain scenarios, right? You're basically taking actions based on what you see. So the point of like somebody mentioned about logs years ago, we used to do this from an automation perspective. Was mine logs? I worked at a at a, a hmm. large antivirus company. And we would mine logs, use elk stack, things like that, mine the logs. And then if we saw certain things that we crafted into what we'd be consider as triggers, we would actually kick a web hook off or something like that and do a thing. Lock down firewalls. Oh, look at this. 
That's awesome. <laughs> hey. You know, it <laughs> no, no, it's <laughs> opinion. That's awesome. That's is awesome. that the hard hat or something? Like, yeah, well, yeah, he's, he's got a hard hat on. You want to come tell everybody well, about it? Be a foreman on? hat. Yeah, let him talk to him. <laughs> he's like, no. That's fine. It's okay. <laughs> you can take a tool over there. Come on, bring a tool over. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, you're you know, good, man. That's awesome. Weight. He's Bob, he's Bob the Builder. I didn't have my on air light on, so they didn't have any idea. Oh, come over here. Come That's over cool. Here. Oh, it's just like <laughs> I like that too. I like it. Like, got the drill and uh, something else. Serious okay. stuff. What is that? A screwdriver. That's awesome, <laughs> man. <laughs> Can you fix his microphone for him? He sounds really bad. Does he have an, <laughs> he he have an hourly? Does he have an that. hourly rate, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we we are talking about tools well, too. <laughs> We're talking about tools too, buddy. Just different kinds of tools. Cool. Yeah, exactly. Your tools are much more fun, I think. Yeah, your tools actually are more fun. Yeah, now you got to tell them about the culture and process change to make those tools. Work <laughs> right. right. That's you need to read the. Oh, that's. A Sorry, that's no, no, no. We need we need we need product management it's, now. Now we have to go all. His the way tools back work better than our tools. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's, That's right. what he said. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> you see, Eddie, I want the bedtime you... story where all the tools do what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do them. I don't want <laughs> any more of these real stories. That's right. right. <laughs> That's great. Actually, that's interesting uh, comment. I think we have we are building too many Swiss Army knives, and yes. and that's that's uh, putting yeah. us in trouble. Like I, this will do everything for you, and it's like no thanks. So there's uh, what's the movie? Uh, it's the Ben uh, Matthew McConaughey movie where he goes to space or whatever, and they're in some outer dimension, and they find this black hole or something, and uh, <clears throat> it was th there were he was this cut scene where he's talking to his dad, and it was like uh, this current time is what they were talking about. It's like there was something new and shiny every day. It's like we didn't know what to do with all this new and shiny stuff. We had so much of it, and now look at us. We can barely scrape by as a as a as an existence, right? as like a, you know, the human race was going extinct basically because some plague had taken over the crops of the planet. So yeah, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, yes, we do have something very new and shiny every day, right? Like Alexis, Alex, Alexis just released something to help people like manage cube cuddle. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> you know? yeah, so yeah. it's like, there's so many layers upon layers that we can add here. It's like, let's just keep going down this rabbit hole and see how far we go. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I Go ahead. go ahead. I have an edge point, but go first. No, no actually, I think I, I came to into uh, operations from the business application side. Like I developed business software for about first 12, 13 years, and then more of like infrastructure or software or EMC and VMware, stuff like that. I think the core software constructs are missing in the ops world. Like it's still very scripted kind of world, according to me. It's not well thought through. It's not object oriented in its way. And the enca encapsulation and is 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 not sort of uh, embraced, if you will. So it's um, we are getting there gradually with the introduction of APIs. We had this discussions prior to this this uh, talk uh, earlier. I think um, I think APIs will save us from this mess a little bit. Cause, yeah, uh, I, th I think I agree with that because, and, and you're starting to see that happen um, in the past year or so, I'd say, where I'm hearing more about people who are writing Terraform using libraries and includes and like normal techniques that you might use for code reuse. Um, exactly. Yeah. And that's not the way it was no. built and, until and, recently. And that scares the hell out of me. I don't know about anybody else. I'll be honest. What scares you? The, the the programming language within like Terraform and things like that. Keep that shit out of there. DSLs <laughs> and Jinja <Gingy laughs> and stuff like that. And, yeah. uh, we, we did we had, we had Palumi we had <laughs> exactly. we had Palumi give a talk a little while a couple of a couple of times ago, um, which which was very and I, yeah. I, I, but that's I think different, your, right? Your point's interesting. Yeah. Is it? Well I mean because Palumi is more about let me load a Python library and let me codify the thing based on what I want. Right. I mean, at least that's my I, understanding. I it. see them as being much more code like yeah. than Terraform. Like they're yeah. you're actually building your programming and then they're they're pulling in yes. some of these these libraries. Yeah, they're pulling the libraries in. So I would say, yes, put the code in there. But from putting code in like a 
like HCL and, and all these different things in Terraform doing all this magical stuff, pull that out of there, make it good at what it does be a JSON, HCL, whatever you I don't, want it to I do. don't think you can get business solutions out out of just JSON or just YAML without some kind some of logic in there somewhere, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I think I think that's a great point, but I would have called this wrong years ago. I, I would have thought cloud management platforms would have been standard by now because that was supposed to be the promise, right? Thing, right? To have mm -hmm. all of that single pane of glass, chef, puppet, doesn't matter. You've got an interface to find your blueprints, push it out. Most of those are dead or acquired at this point. Yep. Uh, we called a lot of that wrong in the industry, but that's where we thought we would be. When you look at it from a maturity standpoint, though, compared to where we were five to 10 years ago, we really don't have a much more mature enterprise type uh, software tool like a CMP that really, you know, governs all of this. People are still kind of rolling their own. Yep. Yeah, I remember, uh, what was it in Stratius back in about 2012? <laughs> Dell bought them. Rob might remember that one. I do. I do. Still not here, right? Now Now that we've got the latest multi-cloud trend coming back and a lot of marketing and buzzwords and uh, we'll see. So this, well, Donnie, this is, go ahead, Bobby. Now, Don, it's interesting you mentioned, I worked for a competitor of Instratis called Service Mesh before they got yeah, acquired. It. And what ended up being weird was, I think the concept was ahead of its time. If, if they were, if they were getting funded and launched now, I think it would have been different. We were doing multi-cloud stuff in 2012 and people weren't ready for it yet. So sometimes the right tech comes along at the wrong time and people just mm -hmm. don't pay attention to it. Yep. Yep. Uh, that's for sure. Totally. I, the, the thing that's interesting to me since we're, we're talking Terraform is Terraform's, right? Cause you know, both of the examples you gave and there's, you know, we have a graveyard of multi-cloud uh, tools that tried to create a single API. Terraform sort of said, screw it. Right. We're not, Right, the, there is no single provider model for all of the clouds. If you want to automate Amazon with Terraform, you're using Terraform. But the Terraform plan looks nothing like the Google plan, right? Exactly. I mean, I literally, I was just building a, a, a plan that could do both. Yep. And they don't share, even, like, even the base thing of like my SSH keys aren't called the same, like they're not even done the same way in the same resources. It's... There's no, so the, the Terraform was able to give us a tool that had both, but not a single, I mean, the Instratia stuff, right? They had that um, API wrapper that was supposed to normalize the clouds and the clouds sort of like, <laughs> we're not going to help you with that. Um, so Bobby, I mean, that's, it's a really interesting point. Do you think that it's taught, like people want the Rosetta Stone API for cloud? I think they want something, I mean, kind of back to Sarjeet's point, I think they want something to insulate them from that. Yeah. Because, you know, part of this is at a higher mm -hmm. level, we still are very far, the promise and the practicality of a lot of these things we're still very far away from. Even when you look at things like CSED, the average customer, um, you know, my, cus my company looks at a lot of the uh, variations in cloud providers and stuff like that. The average customer will not feel mature enough to take advantage of, hey, this VM dropped 30% last night, let's redeploy our code. In theory, CICD should let us do that. In practice, nobody's doing that. Yeah. Right? There's a big gap between the, the potential and the actual, you know, where the rubber meets the road. We're just not there yet. So some of it, do people desire to get there? Yes. Are they willing to do the work to make the change and have the culture and behavior be adjusted? No. We, we still want a tool to be a magic bullet at this point. I would add to that too. I mean, even you're absolutely right, a tool. But, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for, say, companies to come into this space where they actually take over. Hey, don't worry about that thing. Let us abstract it for you and okay. control it and handle it for you and not worry about the day to day down in the minutia of things and roll on and make sure that from a, uh, a, an offering to the customer in which you say we're abstracting everything to allow you to flex any which way you want to go. Mm -hmm. The other problem, too, is sorry, Rob, go ahead. No, go. Sure. The, the other problem too is that doing the switch, right, is the, the cost to that, right, Larry? Like having to stop and think and redeploy. And the problem is that eight out of 10 companies, I would say, are still at a very reactive yes. point. So they just can't, they absolutely can't because no, everything's moving so bloody fast that we can't literally step back and say, oh my God, what's the best way to do this versus what's the fastest way and what's gonna be you know, what's going to calm the people who are screaming at us. Exactly. You and know? I think Bobby that, said it. Yeah, go ahead. That's, that's exactly to me the problem. And that's, 
definitely, you know, what I've banged my head against for the last five years um, at Legal Suite, right? Yep. And I think Bobby said it best too, is, is the lot, we've been able to do this stuff for a long time, just companies aren't ready for it. And, and not even just companies, individuals themselves. And, and, and it's a lot of, you know, I, I was on one of the uh, HashiCorp ambassador call this morning. And one of the things that we're, we're talking about is, is getting people more up to speed on how to use these tools properly, right? Um, to, to approach these things, not just, hey, it's this shiny tool, let us do a thing. But how do you get down, not so much in the weeds, the beginner level of things, how do I actually do this? Rob brought up console. Console is a good, great thing. We used console in our edge solution that we talked about years ago. And, and from that context, the reality was three, four years ago, most companies weren't ready for console. I watched a call, a call earlier today, Cisco ACI is integrating console now. Everybody's on them bandwagon now. But to Bobby's point, people still aren't ready for it because they don't have the foundation of how they actually do these things, right? Right, and then you add to that um, transitional people, right? People are moving more and more, you know, as, as it, it, certainly in our generation. I mean, my mom's generation, everyone stayed for 35 years. You don't have that anymore, exactly. right? So the in, in, institutional knowledge of like, you know, where we started, where we are now, where we need to go, is also not being retained. So when you have people moving out of there every two, three years in their positions, you're just gonna end up with, in some cases, you know, if you're not hiring people who sort of come from the same ilk, right? Mm -hmm. Then you're gonna walk in and be like, oh my God, I wanna do this, you know, versus what they already had started down a path, which never ended up being rolled out properly, which goes back to something, um, Keith said earlier, which is, you know, the guy on the plane came up with a big, great idea because he sat next to somebody, right? Um, and that's part of the problem. You're never going to get buy-in at your sea level to do this, to get the money, to get the resources, to spend the time, to spend the equity to do it because we're always chasing our tails. And that sure, to me yeah. is the biggest problem. I think yeah, I think the one thing, one term I'm trying to point for last uh, year or so is the skills gravity along with the data gravity there's a skills gravity people mm -hmm. know certain stuff and they keep doing the same stuff again and again it's by nature humans are like that they don't want to change i i can give you an example like we did a big project in in germany with, with siemens and they were using green screen for b2b e-commerce and all that stuff and they say I, if i press f5 and f2 it does this and i have to click four times to do that on your new system like i'm not going to change right even though it's much cheaper to operate better system and all the xml and all the good stuff it's like no for me it's more work for the end user right so i think uh, that skills yeah. gravity keeps people where it is i think I, I usually say like, if you want to out compete the market, you have to out educate the market. You have to educate, educate, educate. So that's, there's no yeah. other way out for you to put your tech out there. You have to educate the market. You have to put stuff out there, make Word. it easy to consume, easy to get to. We're not building I think in, that, in that case though, it's also yet. about like, uh, it's also about the user experience. Like who are you building for? Are you building for the power user or are you building for the inexperienced user? Um, are you building for the people who stick at companies for 20 years or the people who are bouncing every couple of years and they have different needs. And so I think that technology popularity will shift over time based on that. We, we used to call it the reorg half-life, by the way. Well, we, we found that with our, with our stuff, you could get a champion and that every 18 months, there's a reorg of some sort. Somebody leaves, they, they reorg, they change. And if you can't provide value within the reorg window, um, your, your toast. Wow. Rob, I think, Sometimes I think the cross pollination brings new ideas. Um, yes. but I, I think edge deployments are going to be multi-year deals. You're not going to ship infrastructure out to, a you know, distributed infrastructure out in a six month project. It's, it's going to be big. Yeah. Edge is something. a bigger mess. Yeah, I think I think there is a point that Rob mentioned though that's that's key is that a lot of these things require multi-year investments and most executives are still incentivized on a yearly basis, right? So if you think about the enterprise like a house, you want to be the person who took credit for redesigning the kitchen and putting in granite counters, not replacing windows and patching the roof, 
Mm. But if you want to do yeah. shiny yeah. stuff that's going to get you promoted. So unless you can work those two things in together, you're not going to take it on because you're going to get shot. That's a good point. Good, very good point. That's a very good point. <laughs> that's astounding. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We're recording this, eh? I would, I would, I would, I would go out on on that comment. If, you know, but we have another mic minute. Drop. Somebody, the, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the mic drop to me. I love the granite countertops and roof repair. <laughs> that was My wife's a realtor, man. so <laughs> I steal from her. Shh, that's excellent, everybody. This was fun. I, I feel like we could go another hour because um, there's we're only touching the surface on some of these things. So. Um, Next, next week, we've got um, IP tables. The week after that, we're going to talk about managing DevOps as a, as a group discussion. I'm counting on a couple of you who, who said, oh my God, when we, I brought it up to help count on it. So that's on the fourth. And then I'm, I'm, I've got people bouncing around for the next, next couple. If you see somebody, I'm intentionally not loading our schedule up. Uh, too far in advance so that if somebody shows up with a Twitter war or something like that, we can just, we can respond to it. But if you have people, just let, let me know. I don't think we're a scary crowd, so it doesn't have to be. Uh, just you, Rob. Just, I am. <laughs> that is true. I was able to get a haircut, so I'm good now. <laughs> I'm less scary now. All I'm just I want rubbing in haircut. the Canada factor. <laughs> uh, all I want is a real haircut. A real hair. I just want some damn hair. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, we we have to weird, weave in this hair analogy into some systems talk somehow. Exactly. Which one? Oh, I could yeah. totally do that. I could totally make the the COVID nineteen hair cutting DevOps talk. Like, yeah, give yeah, me yeah. give me an hour. I'll be good. <laughs> hey, you talk about hair all the time. I don't, don't even have any, you know. It's like, why? Well, it's not my problem. So, <laughs> I think I've been, this, the informal survey is that there's some. There about half the group has under has, has figured out the right way. Not maybe half. Third have figured out how to how to beat this thing. I think I think Chris needs to figure out how to work his son into one of the uh, the calls to show us how tools are really used properly. Yeah, and, and actual useful tools. Folks. Exactly, yeah. that'd be awesome. He could, he could he could do a Floby demo on you. <laughs> there you go. Let's make some hair. <laughs> that would be amazing. All right. On that nice. note, everybody, I will see you all next week. This was a all blast. Right. See you guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you. I can't put myself in the same category as Michael or, or Larry, right? To, um, sorry, I don't, I, or the rest of you, I don't know you all, <laughs> you know. Um, I can't, uh, or Donnie, I can't put myself in that category because it's, it, it, but, you know, um, but I, at the same time, I can manage the snowflakes of the snowflakes, as I like to call them. Good management. And it's really nice to be able to deliver as a manager. It is very, very nice and rewarding to deliver a product or a project as a manager. And, you know, your team was able to, to, to pull through. And that, that is a certain type of, that is a certain type of rewarding. And I've always had, you know, strong team leads to back me up that way, right? And some team leads are great at mentoring, but not great at managing, right? So that's also how I've um, taught some people who have progressed from devs to team leads and then do want to do the management kind of thing, right? Like it's, it's a great way for me to like upskill somebody to their career growth if that's what they want to do. You know, when I was at Legal Suite, it's funny because when I joined, the guy that hired me as the technical director was so happy because he's like, oh, in a year you get to take over my job because I don't want to manage people. But like he never wanted it. And now that he's left when he, he came back and he worked for me as for a year um, as a contractor, but then the next um, like on his other positions now, he's just, he's a tech. He has no desire at all to manage a team, none, but he's a great teacher and he's a great mentor, but the rest of it, having to deal with the CEO, having to deal with the arguments about why are we late, having to talk to client. He's like, are you fucking crazy? I do not want to do that. <laughs> so, but that's my wheelhouse. That's where I'm good. That's, you know. That transition is hard. Most of the time, the best players are lousy uh, coaches. That's the fact. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you're here, man. <laughs> <laughs> good to see you again. Good to see you, Danny. 
this is it's bad that we we don't travel anymore so i know seeing each other i know in person well keith is trying to smuggle me into atlanta from canada yeah i, I would recommend staying out you might not get back <laughs> It might be a good idea to stay where you are. I know. Well, our numbers are on their way down. <laughs> Ours aren't. Yeah, no, no. No. So I, I, I actually, I had to get tested yesterday, so we'll hopefully, hopefully everything's okay. But yeah, not good. Yeah. One of these days, when it's all said and done, I'll talk about how interesting it is to try to make money in this market. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear about that someday. <laughs> it might seem a little morbid, so I'll, I'll save it for when we can laugh about this stuff afterwards. Mm -hmm. But there is a lot of money on the table. I'll just put it that way. There are definitely opportunities. In your, yeah. Your... By us, people are playing more video games, so we're making more money. <laughs> <laughs> work for video game you're certain. You I mean, that's, that's always that's always the case. There's right in in any market transition. There's there there are going to be opportunities um, from that perspective. I yeah. The only time. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead, please. No, I was going to say the only time I never I didn't see that is what during what I call the seven, and that was the the dot com bust. And I call it a seven mm. because you know normally you fall off the cliff, but at least you start where you fell. That was the only time in my life where I experienced you went backwards dramatically, like a mm -hmm. seven. <laughs> Interesting way to think about it. Uh, I was dying in San Diego. Yeah, and and I had this this puffy moment kind of when I saw the the Miracle Grow stock went up like, well, up like you know seventy eighty percent because people are staying home. And they're growing plants <laughs> at home. Yeah, and they they want to do plants? something. <laughs> I was like, well, that's a weird kind of side effect of uh, this uh, uh, situation. Oh yeah, uh, you, you will never. Huh? You couldn't. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Yeah, yeah, you can't, I couldn't make that connection, but it, it's happening. Right? You so. couldn't buy. You couldn't get anything here. Um, you know, like everything, all the plants, all the stuff, everything was sold out. You could buy a planter to save your life here. It was gold. You know. <laughs> Because everyone just went, and as soon as the garden centers opened, they were like, "Hell yes!" Because <laughs> some things you can do outside. That's what, that's what I want to know is what what is everybody growing? It can't be tomato plants. Come on. No, well, <laughs> I've I've got uh, <laughs> medicinal crops. <laughs> so go. I, technically, I go. could because I'm in Canada <laughs> grow medicinal, but I've got cauliflower and tomatoes and a ton of herbs and beets and strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, and, and medicinal. <laughs> and, and and what is that? Herbs. <laughs> herbs. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's that's yeah, but it's it's the supply chains are so tight for what if people start consuming something out of uh, out of cycles, like what yeast flew up. Like they they don't produce. You know, there's not that much yeast packets normally sold. So <laughs> it didn't take much for that to be completely upended. You know what else? Skim milk powder. Really. I had a, a, a marmite that? shortage in the UK. I, oh, no. I had to, yeah. <laughs> I, had to uh, I put skim milk powder in my, in like my smoothies and stuff because I need to get extra protein in. Uh, and you couldn't buy skim milk powder to save your life here. You still can't. Like, um, because like people were getting it to stockpile it because of, at least they can make milk with it, right? So I just put it in my smoothies and stuff. And flour, the whole thing. Definitely flour. That was one of the time, the benefits of being gluten free for me is that, that there wasn't as much a run on gluten free flour as there was on uh, wheat flour. 